It's a film about you being your own worst enemy, as in the individual being their own worst enemy. Um, and it's about con men. It's not easy for the mind to understand it. We open on Jake Green, a cockney hard man who's just been released from a seven year stretch in solitary confinement, but he's used his time to learn some new things. Two years later, Jake and his brother Billy visit Matcha, the crime lord that's responsible for sending Jake on the job that led to his incarceration. Jake is there to collect the money that he believes is owed to him. He makes a wager on a coin toss and ends up leaving with a large amount of Matcha's money. As Jake leaves the casino, he is handed a business card by a stranger and informed that he can help. The card says, take the elevator. But since being inside, Jake has developed a fear of enclosed spaces and opts to take the stairs. He ends up fainting. An examination cannot find anything medically wrong, but the doctor runs some tests and informs Jake that he will get the results in a couple of days. Jake and his entourage arrive home and he finds another business card on the floor, which reads, pick this up. And as he stoops over, he narrowly misses a gun shop and then several bullets come flying their way. The mysterious man from the casino turns up and tells Jake to get in the car. In a room filled with blue light, Maka learns that the hitman he sent to kill Jake Green has missed his target. And he never misses his target. Zack, the man who rescued Jake, takes him to see Avi. Over a game of chess, he is told that they have his medical results. He does not have long to live. But these two men can help him if he just does what they say. Jake is told to withdraw all the money he earned gambling and bring it back to Zack and Avi as they are going to use it for loan sharking. Maka tries to see a gangland boss, but only gets to see his second in command. Maka has been entrusted with doing some work for the off-screen Mr. Gold. Jake tells the story of his incarceration. His cell was sandwiched between that of a chess grandmaster and a confidence trickster, who used to pass notes via library books back and forth. One day, out of the blue, those two inmates vanished. But from them, Jake Green learned the formula that would later win him money from gambling. Avi, Zack and Jake stage a heist and steal a safe, which turns out to belong to Maka and is filled with drugs that belong to Mr. Gold. Maka is desperate to replace the drugs, so visits a rival gang boss, Lord John, who declines to make the deal with his enemy. Zack, Avi and Jake then rob Lord John and frame Maka. Avi phones Jake and tells him that he is now free of his disease, and a doctor confirms it. Lord John sends a hitwoman to kill Maka in a restaurant, but he only loses a finger in the gunfight. Maka sends his hitman to kill Lord John, but his henchmen implicate Jake whilst being tortured. Unbeknownst to Maka, Jake has already donated the money stolen to a charity under Maka's name. On a rooftop, Avi and Zack explain that the voice inside his head is not him and the voiceover we have heard throughout the movie is lying to him. The gangster, Mr. Gold, has no power, and by liberating himself of his money, he has removed himself from the game. You've heard that voice for so long, you believe it to be you. That night, Jake breaks into Macca's penthouse, but instead of killing him, he asks for forgiveness. In the elevator going down, Jake finally manages to separate himself from his ego, and now has nothing to fear. In the end, we, we thought we made the film too clear and that we, we, we tried to um, make it more cryptic. Um, but we were amazed that you know, more people didn't just say, oh, blimey, I couldn't see that coming. I can't imagine anyone truly getting this film on the first viewing, as it is filled with numerology and symbolism. Why a blood disease? Well, that, if I get into that, again, we're going to be here for hours. But blood... Can you summarise it? Yeah, well, blood's red and blood belongs next to black. So there's three columns going on. Green is central column, white is right column, black is left column. Right, can you explain that and what, what that means? Uh, well, everything manifests in processes of three. So you've got proton, neutron, electron, sun, earth, moon, masculine, feminine, child. So wherever you're going to go, you're going to see a sort of manifestation of three. Did you get all that? Good. Because there's more. Oh my God. Jake sort of represents you know, all of us, I think. We're all sort of chosen to a degree because you know, we're all players within our own little games. The perceived enemy is not the real enemy. The only opponent Jake Green has to, uh, to challenge and to wrestle is himself. We embody all of these characters. We all em we embody all the aspects of vice. We also embody all the aspects of 
competition, wanting to play the game and wanting to succeed in the game. Everybody thinks is themselves is probably not themselves. So he learns that what we know is nothing. Apparently this ties in somehow with Kabbalah, which Guy Ritchie's then wife, Madonna, was into at the time. Yeah. Kabbalah, you were born Catholic, right? I was born Catholic. You raised... are now Jewish? Um, you wear the Jewish star? Well, I wear the Jewish star, but I'm not, I haven't converted to Judaism and I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not, not Jewish in the conventional sense because the Kabbalah is, um, is a, a belief system that predates religion and predates Judaism as an organized religion. Explain that. It's a, it's a belief system. It's incredibly scientific and as I said it predates religion. Um, I think people, um, a lot of the rituals, well all of the rituals have been appro appropriated by the Jewish faith. Um, but? but but I think people have misinterpreted and or have left out the true and deep metaphysical reason for all of those things. I'll be quite honest, I have done a little bit of reading about Kabbalah and I don't really get it. But I did find these two videos about it. Kabbalah. Everybody want to know what Kabbalah is. Kabbalah being the Kabbalah to receive. Because within the Kabbalah, you have all the secret that you want to know about the divine, how to connect, how to be happy, when not to receive. It's also something. When to receive. How to earn it. Because according to Kabbalah, you got to much at the time, meaning only when you earn it, you can be happy. Kabbalah is not the Jewish teachings, rituals, and customs that you learned in Hebrew school. But they are related. In case you missed it before, Kabbalah is the mystical and hidden aspects of Judaism. Imagine that Judaism was one big video game. Round one. Kabbalah would be like the super difficult to beat, super hard to find, big boss level that you can only get to once you've been playing like your entire life. Kabbalah has to do with the creation of the world and how we interact with it on its most mystical of levels. I don't have a great deal of interest in religion. I'm not a believer. I also don't believe in ghosts. Most conspiracy theories are nonsense. Time travel in anything other than a linear sense is impossible. There's no more chance of psychic powers existing than there is the Loch Ness Monster. But all of these things work really well in stories, and therefore movies. However, I am quite interested in philosophy. A great change of our psychological attitude is imminent. That is certain. Why? Well, because we need more. We need more psychology. We need more understanding of human nature because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger and we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. His psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil. Carl Jung refers to a fundamental transformation of psyche as an ego death. I felt that Jung should tell me what I should do, whether I should write a book, whether I should uh, get a divorce, what I should do. And he wouldn't. And so I got mad at him. And uh, I uh, said, why is everybody so mean to me? And he said, why are you so mean to everybody? So I stormed out. And uh, you got what I said there. I said to him, why is everybody so mean to me? And he said, why are you so mean to everybody? That was the trigger point. I was gone for a year. And I wrote him, oh, I don't know. Every now and then I'd sit down at the typewriter and write him what a son of a bitch I thought he was. And how when I first got to Europe, Europe everyone thought he was a charlatan. I thought he was too. And, and uh, uh, I didn't, uh, he was the most conceited, vain man. And, and uh, I, you know, I really had a great time. And um, and you sent all these sent letters. Sent the letters, of course I did. And I thought, I hope he drops dead of a stroke. And uh, I felt very good. I didn't. <laughs> I just felt fine. When I can get mad, my I, f I can lose five pounds just by getting mad. It's <laughs> just the adrenaline goes, and I just think, you know, it's the opposite of poor little me. And it's I don't care. They let the world go and stuff it up. I don't care what happens to them. And um, then one morning I woke up and I began to laugh. I thought, for God's sake, what's been going on here? What a jack at you. And suddenly I realized, sure, he really hit it. 
And so I phoned Ms. Schmidt, Fraulein Schmidt, and asked if I could have an appointment. And she laughed and said, oh, yes, she said, Professor Jung told me to save some time for you. He thought you'd be calling shortly. At the climax of this film, Jake Green goes through a literal ego death when he finally comes to terms with the fact that the voice in his head is not him. Fucking mad is this, Jake? Come on. Arguing with yourself. Silly. Oh, silly, silly, silly. Oh, so silly, Jack. I can hear you. What? I can hear you. You what? I'm on to you. I'm not sure if Jim Carrey subscribes to the philosophy of Jung, but this is sort of what he means when he says he does not exist. Wait, tell me, is it true you're wandering the streets? You need a date to the party? What's up? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm doing just fine. Uh, I just, uh, you know, there's no meaning to any of this. So I, uh, I wanted to find the most meaningless thing that I could f come to and join. And, uh, and, uh, and here I am. They're celebrating- I mean, you gotta admit it's completely meaningless. Well, they say they're celebrating icons inside. Celebrating Do you believe icons. In icons, boy, that is just the absolute lowest aiming, you know, possibility that we could come up with. It's like icons. What do you do? You believe in icons? I don't I believe in personalities. I don't believe that you exist. But there is a, a wonderful fragrance in the air. You don't believe certain icons have the power to make change, to think differently, to be bold, to inspire others? Artistry, you're one of them. On the good foot. Ha! Yeah. You shut her down now. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I don't believe in icons. Uh, I don't believe in personalities. I believe that peace lies beyond personality. For whatever reason, and many have speculated it, Jim Carrey has come to the realisation that the persona which is imposed upon him through people's identification with his movies is not him. And he has no desire to live up to that which he is not. This is the voice of the ego. <laughs> and if you listen to it, there will always be someone who's doing better than you. No matter what you gain, ego will not let you rest. It will tell you that you cannot stop until you've left an indelible mark on the earth, until you've achieved immortality. How tricky is this ego? that it would tempt us with the promise of something we already possess. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on a keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor at his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. I am not much of a gamer, but this is one of the few games I have played and played a lot, the Stanley Parable. It's about an office drone who always does as he's told. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. The game has a voiceover narrating your actions, and if you follow its instruction, then it leads to a fairly innocuous 20 minutes of gameplay. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. But if you disobey the narration, it gets very interesting. The protagonist of the story would not be confined by the rules of the game it was created for. The more agreeable the player is in real life, the more this simple act feels like rebellion, and therefore a lot of fun. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't five years ago. Sorry, any film of this nature is going to cause me to get sidetracked a little. Because everything in it is in reference to something else. 
Even its title, Revolver, is apparently chosen because the letters reflect the symmetry of a chessboard. Revolver. I like the name of it for a start. If you're in a game, the game just keeps revolving until you realise that you're actually in a game, and then maybe you can start evolving. I wish to deliver what is seen as a an action movie, I, sp I suppose. I I'd like to see it as a sort of inter intellectual action movie. If anything, I think the symbolism bogs this film down after a while. It feels like the filmmakers were so invested in getting the story to work on a subtextual level that they sacrificed coherence. Are you both happy with the final cut? Jim and I, two, two weeks before the end, we started to feel the first vibrations <laughs> of negativity <laughs> quaking their way towards us. So my ass clucked a bit. I obviously laughed like a jackal when swept away, effectively torched Guy Ritchie's career. Because, hey, I never liked Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. I never liked Snatch. There was something really funny about seeing him just foul up that badly. But only somebody of absolute inhumanity could find it in themselves in the end to laugh at something as desperately bad as Revolver. I mean, if I was a GP and somebody walked into my surgery and pitched Revolver, I would reach for the medicine cabinet. I would immediately prescribe, you know, uh, electroshock therapy and leeches. I would have men in white coats take them away. I would take away their shoe. I mean, it is the work of a very, very mad imagination that believes, A, no one else in the world saw the usual suspects or Twin Peaks, or any other sort of slightly, you know, arty crime thriller that nobody else has ever read any books and that therefore has never ever come across any of these incredibly complicated quotations before, that nobody else has ever stumbled upon the concept that, you know what, in the end, the worst enemy that you could have could be you. Now, for the first 20 minutes, I just sat there thinking, oh, this is it. But the idea of Guy Ritchie, the guy whose entire career is built on making stupid, vacuous, flashy guns and geezers movie, coming on like some philosophy student and lecturing, and here's the, it's, it's, he keeps telling us how complicated the concept of this movie is. It's not complicated, Guy. And incidentally, I have been th thinking about it since Monday, since you told me to do it. I thought it was imbecilic five minutes in. Five minutes in, I knew exactly what was going on in the movie and I was thinking on the one hand I'm really glad you haven't made Lock, Stock and Snatch again but then suddenly you realise no but I realise what you have made and actually now I wish you had made Lock, Stock and Snatch again because at least they were just stupid and funny I mean it is like watching the your worst nightmare happening on screen so badly that you actually think I feel sorry for Guy Ritchie because I can wake up tomorrow morning and think I didn't make that film but he has to wake up tomorrow morning and think I made Revolver. Really vitriolic reviews came out somehow I can't remember but they start to come through and uh, so Jim and I said you know he sh shut me up and sat me down and said now you watch it and if you've got a problem with it I'll, I'll take something out and uh, me him and a couple of chaps sat down Went through it, top of the tail. I couldn't find a problem with it. Go where? Yeah, so until I couldn't, you know, sat there and I was calm until the assault really smacked me, and then uh, I had to review it again. But I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. There's nothing that I would have changed. There's nothing I would have changed. And yet, change it, he did. When it was first released in the UK, it originally ran 110 minutes. But it was re-edited, with some scenes being removed, others being reordered, and some of the deleted scenes, which were first considered to be giving too much away, were put back in. I don't know which version is considered to be the director's cut, but the interview you just saw, in which Richie said he would make no changes, was referencing the British edit. And I mean, you know, it's by far a film that I'm, I'm happier that I've made than any other film I've ever done. The different versions end in quite different places, the British one having a kidnapped child subplot not present in the American version. It ends with Macca becoming the victim of his own ego and blowing himself away. The movie then cuts to black and save for a copyright notice there are no credits. The American version ends with the revelation of where Jake knows Zack and Avi from, something that happens earlier in the British edit. Then it cuts to documentary interviews of people talking about the themes of the film while the credits roll. The problem is that the ego hides in the last place that you'd ever look within itself. It disguises its thoughts as your thoughts, its feelings as your feelings. It, you, you think it's you. People's need to protect their own egos knows no bounds. They will lie, cheat, steal, kill, do whatever it takes to maintain what we call ego boundaries. People have no 
clue that they're in prison. They don't know that there is an ego. They don't know the distinction. At first, it's difficult for the mind to accept that there's some something beyond itself, that there's something uh, of, of greater value and greater capacity for discerning truth than itself. In religion, the ego manifests as the devil. And, of course, no one realizes how smart the ego is because... It created the devil so you could blame someone else. But what do I really think about it? Go on. Go tell on, everyone it's on, terrible. Everyone terrible. It's no one terrible. likes no it because it's crap. 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 Go Richie, you make crap. Mark Kermode does it. Tell everyone it's rubbish. Everyone rubbish. It's rubbish. People love it when they say rubbish. If it's not good enough for Mark Kermode, it's not good enough for you. Tell everyone it's rubbish. Tell everyone how rubbish it is. This is the worst film ever made. I quite liked it. I saw this movie when it was first released, and the craze for British gangster films had pretty well passed. But this renewed my interest, at least for a little while. Guy Ritchie has mastered the backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards style of storytelling, so it unfolds in an unpredictable way, even if the story elements don't surprise you, Mr Kerr mode. It also looks great. So many British films are shot on 16mm with grim, natural light. This is as visually slick as Martin Scorsese's most recent films. The sequence of Mac as Hitman searching around the house for hidden assailants is edited like no film I had seen before or after this point. You could call it pretentious, and that's a quality it would have to own, because it is. But is that as big a crime as it's made out to be? I'd take pretentious over unimaginative any day. Possibly the biggest mistake Guy Ritchie made was making this story in his regular metier of a gangster film. Crime stories are not known for their metaphorical nature. If they could somehow reskin this film like they do with computer games and make it aesthetically a science fiction, then I think its highfalutin ideas would work alongside such films as The Matrix. Perhaps that's a job for AI. That's very good, Mr. Green. But tell me. Does your m- a donkey? <laughs> Personally, I think this is Guy Ritchie's best film, and it's time for it to be reassessed. Or maybe that's just what the voice in my head is telling me to say. I'm Scott Kingsnorth, and I'm making a movie.